And joining us now to discuss the recent elections to the European Parliament is Mr. Martin Zaborowski, political analyst. Good morning and welcome to TVP World. Good morning. So now, uh, how strong? I mean, of course, there were forecasts. Uh, but how strong is the swing to the right? And what impact will it have on the new term of the European Parliament? Uh, it is consistent with the forecast that, uh, that you mentioned. Uh, I, there, there is some swing. Uh, and there is definitely a loss on the on behalf of the centrist parties, which the uh, far right uh, has benefited from. Uh, but it's nothing falling out of the margins of what was being predicted. I mean, of course, if you put all the right far right parties together, then it is very considerable, because you have. Uh, 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 the European Conservatives and Reformists, this is the grouping where the Polish law and justice belongs to, you have identity and democracy, then you have the alternative for Germany, which stands alone independently, and you have the Hungarian Fides, which is also standing alone. So if you put all these votes together, that would be around 150 m uh, seats in the European Parliament. The thing is that they don't act together, they are divided between three, four groupings in reality, uh, and they are unable to really form uh, a united front. But, uh, but it is an indicator of uh, where the European sentiments are really these days. So now uh, I'd like to get to the coalitions in a second, but what do you make of the news that came out of France with Emmanuel Macron saying that he is calling for a snap election in light uh, of these results to the European Parliament? Well, uh, it, it was, it, it's a move which also was somehow predicted by his uh, strategist. Uh, the, uh, uh, the French system is that, uh, you know, there is a president which has almost royal powers, and then there is a prime minister, and probably most people would not know what is the name of the current prime minister. And it's usually a prime minister who's doing lots of unpopular, difficult thing, things. And when people take on the street and protest, then uh, the president changes prime minister, calls for a new election, does, you know, all these kind of things. It's kind of above the politics. So this time, uh, the uh, expectation is there that probably Marine Le Pen party will win the election. And then she or somebody who she would nominate would form the government. Uh, and would need to be in charge of all the unpopular things that prime ministers need to be in charge of. Uh, the budget, the cuts, the financial stability, uh, war in Ukraine, all of that. Uh, Marine Le Pen and his party would need to, to take co-responsibility for managing that mess, actually, that France is, uh, in which France finds itself uh, at, at this point in time. And over time, until the new presidential election, which uh, are scheduled for 2027, uh, the expectation is that popularity of, uh, of Marine Le Pen party would suffer, and that it would be just in time to uh, elect a centrist president who would succeed Emmanuel Macron. So now, what about you also mentioned uh, Fides? When it comes to Hungary, what do you make of the result that we have there? We have, of course, this uh, Tisha party and Peter mm -hmm. Magyar. Uh, what do you think, what will he do? Will he join the EPP? Uh, I, I think that, that is uncertain, whether he goes for EPP or whether he goes for Renew Europe. Uh, and I don't think it's actually that important because, I mean, whichever of his groupings he will join, then he can still vote, not necessarily with a grouping. So it's, it's of secondary importance. What, 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 however, is absolutely amazing is that Hungary now has this party which only came out a few months back, which suddenly gets 30% of votes, yeah? which actually means that opposition, if that momentum is sustained, that means that Fidesz can be defeated uh, in the next parliamentary election in 2027, 26. But uh, it's big if, because, of course, uh, for the remaining couple of years, Tisha party could be subjected to a number of uh, investigations, scandals, all of the kind of the things which, uh, which will make uh, the life of Peter Magyar difficult. However, still, uh, only a few months back, we had a picture in which um, Fidesz 
uh, was scoring well above 50 percent. Opposition was disunited, absolutely with no chance to winning anything. And now Tisha looks like a potential winner. So now what about what do you think will be the future of Viktor Orban? Uh, well, uh, I mean, Viktor Orban has only got a, a bright future if he's prime minister. If he's no br prime minister, then life will be pretty difficult for him because uh, 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 it's clear that over the 14 years of him being in government, uh, cast a, a, the country has been married by a number of uh, corruption scandals. Uh, all his family is all over the country managing state-owned companies, uh, having access to uh, luxurious properties and all of that. So uh, if he is ousted from power, then uh, uh, life is likely to be difficult for him and his family and his cronies. And now what about what do you make of the results in Poland? Well, uh, uh, the result in Poland is, uh, uh, is, uh, is a little bit surprising because we, everybody expected that uh, law and justice, the, uh, the current uh, opposition who was in government for eight years, would win this election. Uh, they, they didn't. Uh, they marginally came second. Still, the score is very high. Uh, and if you look into the score, uh, into the division of seats between law and justice, which belongs to the European Conservatives and Reformists, and you look in, and then uh, you combine it with the votes of the far right Confederatia, you see that country is really 50 50. The country is totally split. So, you have the uh, uh, civic coalition, which is currently in power, uh, led by uh, Prime Minister Donald Tusk, uh, and they done very well. They, uh, they came first, uh, but their coalition partners uh, underperformed. Uh, so there is some kind of movement within the coalition, with the coalition partners losing out and the main coalition partner gaining. Uh, and uh, and you can see that the uh, uh, what you have in the opposition is is a very strong performance with far right Confederacja. Uh, so uh, and if you combine both votes, like I said, you really see a country which is split 50-50. And it's also geographically determined like that, with those who are centrist, liberal, uh, being strong in the west of the country and Warsaw and uh, the east of the country and the south, southeast, uh, being very firmly uh, supportive of law and justice and Confederatio. So now when it comes to these results that we have been talking about, uh, both in, let's say, Poland, Slovakia, France and uh, all the other countries, do you think has, has Russia's disinformation played a major role in boosting the far right? Uh, I, I, think, uh, I think it played a role. Uh, it, it definitely is super effective in France, in Italy. Uh, it's, uh, it's also uh, definitely effective in places like Slovakia, which is super vulnerable. Uh, in Hungary, it's kind of not necessarily because the prime minister himself is pro-Russian. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I would say that the, the disinformation is, is out there. It does play some role. I don't think it really is a decisive role, frankly. Uh, I don't think that, that we can talk about that it's because of the Russian disinformation that the election went a certain way. Uh? Mm -hmm. I think it was a factor, but it was one of the factors. Mm -hmm. So what other factors would you say caused or, well, made these results happen? Well, well what we see is the uh, polarization. Uh, polarization around the uh, uh, parties of, uh, you know, pro-European parties being, uh, uh, meaning the European People's Party and Socialists and, and Democrats. So these are the two parties would usually rule uh, in the European Parliament. And then we have the growing far right, uh, but very disunited. And what we have in the center, meaning the Green Party and the Renew Europe, losing massively. So it's the centrists which have lost out on this election more than anybody else. Renew Europe, uh, this is a party where uh, Emmanuel Macron's uh, party belongs to, uh, and uh, this one lost about 22 votes, 22 seats in the parliament. So that's, that's really massive, considering that, uh, considering that it had only 70-something. 
So that's, that's, that's a really considerable drop. And the same similar drop for the Green Party. The Green Party is strong in, was strong in Germany, and obviously being in government affects its popularity in, in the country. Uh, and for a new Europe, I think it's mostly because of the unpopularity of Macron, who indeed is, uh, is, is a deeply unpopular president at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Now, what about, you mentioned Italy, and I wanted to ask The Economist recently, they had a cover with, um, it was Ursula von der Leyen, Georgia Meloni and Marie Le Pen on the cover with the title uh, Women uh, Ruling in Europe. Uh, so now, what is the prospect of a Le Pen-Meloni EPP coalition? I think it's possible, uh, at least tactically, on, uh, a, on, on some voting. And I think it even may come out during the uh, uh, confirmation procedure for, uh, you know, to confirm von der Leyen as the president of the new commission. Uh, she is counting on votes from Meloni. In the past, she had a vote from, uh, uh, from Polish law and justice, uh, which uh, uh, after these five years, they decided they would not vote for von der, Le von der Leyen. Yeah? So they, they changed their mind. Uh, but they now are uh, in minority in the European, uh, in the fraction of European conservatives and, and reformists. And it's likely that law and justice will abstain or will vote against her. But uh, Meloni, uh, I think it's quite possible that, uh, that she should be supporting uh, van der Leyen. And van der Leyen has, has been making a lot of gestures towards Meloni, saying we can work with that woman, she's sensible, she's pro-Ukrainian. Uh, she does not um, uh, question the uh, Washington consensus. She's pro-American. She, uh, she's pro-Western, uh, anti-Russian. So all these kind of things which uh, uh, essentially are important to maintain the, uh, uh, the geopolitical uh, direction of the, of the current commission. So now, when it comes to the commission, and should Ursula von der Leyen once again retain her post, she has said that she would create this new position of a defense commissioner. Mm. Um, what will be the role of the CEE when it comes uh, to the commission and other posts in the European Union? Well, uh, there has been a lot of talk, of course, about the, the post of the, uh, of the Commissioner for Defence and obviously talk about the a potential candidate for this post being the current Polish uh, Foreign Minister, Radek Sikorski. Uh, I understand that uh, Minister Sikorski uh, uh, has not committed to... Uh, 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 he has not, com has not really shown his interest in taking up uh, this position yet. Uh, and this is understandable because uh, at this point in time, uh, there is very little money in EU budget to designate to the defense issues. It's something around, you know, five billion uh, euro, which may sign considerable amount of money. But Poland's alone defense budget is 30 billion euro. Yeah? So this is really a fraction of, of what, what are the needs of the EU. Uh, and Bearing in mind that there is war going on in Ukraine, bearing in mind the you know, situation in Gaza, we are in an extremely difficult situation, uh, so uh, more money is needed. That new commissioner would need to get this money, would need to convince other partners to do that. And uh, it's, it's going to be a difficult job. It's going to be super difficult. At the moment, you don't really have the staff uh, who is um, uh, working on that. You don't have a budget. You have no tradition of the EU working strongly on defense. So this is creating something from the scratch. And I think it, it is probably unlikely that, that a country which uh, has some defense industry, but is not really a giant in defense industry business, meaning Poland, would be uh, chosen to, uh, to lead that, uh, that effort. Um, and I also think that the post of European um, Defence Commissioner would be really about European defence industry rather than about geopolitics. Uh, so, uh, as such, it's perhaps a little bit less attractive for, for, for Minister Sikorski, but I, you know, everything is open out there. Uh, and uh, there are other interesting portfolios uh, up for grabs, such as the High Representative for uh, Foreign and Security Policy and also the uh, Vice President of the European Commission 
with one leg in the Commission, another leg in the Council. So that's a very powerful position. All right. Well, still many things that remain up in the air, and we'll have to see how things turn out. Thank you very, thank you very much for your insight and for speaking to us here on TV sure. World. Thank you. Mr. Martin Zaborowski, pol political analyst, was our guest here today at the e EKF in Sopot.